your feedback today and ongoing is very, very important to us and that's why we're looking at the customer advisory board. There's an opportunity this afternoon to ask questions in the network and yeah, we're looking forward to, to hearing more from you in the future as well. So, with that, over to Walter. All right, cool. So I've got the really exciting job of showing you guys the new features. So let me just get this around. Make sure they can see our screen. And they're on mute at the moment, so we'll see if they've got any um, chat things later on. Okay, so just for the guys on, online, if you've got any questions or, or queries, just type them into the chat and we'll come back to them. And same for the guys um, in the office. Just hold your questions to the end and they'll, and they'll come back. So, new version of the software, 2.5. There's a few chunky bits of the, um, the, the software that we really improved on. I um, mean, I'll just step through them. I know some of you guys haven't seen the software for, for a few versions, so I might even touch on some of the stuff that we've added in since the, the early versions as well. But what I'm actually going to um, go through is actually available on our website. So hopefully some of this, um, this, this website that's on the screen at the moment is not new to some of you guys. You've been to our website in the last probably six months. We've had this since the last six months. And on the uh, support area under product releases, there's actually um, where the details of this release is going to be. So there's a feature summary, and I think there's a handout with Rosa. There's a, there's a handout that Rosa printed out if you want a hard copy. It's, it's out the back there. And even the release notes in detail about what we actually did, and also the, um, the install files. So that's all on our website, so you can get that yourselves. OK, <laughs> so the features. Let me just full screen that. So one of the focus areas for us has been uh, the usability of Modelpedia. You know, over the years, we've been creating a lot of content in Modeler. Um, but the last few years, it's all more about publishing. You know, most of you guys are uh, using Modelpedia now. Um, and that's a, a lot of our focus as well. Um, and one of the things that we did, uh, even maybe about a year or two ago, or even earlier actually, was create these sorts of views. Now, some of you guys saw in earlier demos in our user conference, they had these role views. <coughs> and they were kind of based on tiles and the whole Metro thing when Windows 8 came out. And then some of the feedback that we got was, yeah, Walter, that kind of looks OK. We, we, we want tables, we want lists, we want um, grids and things like that. So um, we added another alternate way of uh, viewing content like this, and that's the new role view. So if I switch back, um, with some of the feedback that we got with some of the clients, they said, OK, actually, give it to me in tabs. Just so conceptually, they just were more comfortable in a more tab design. So we added something that was more aligned to tabs. So this is a, a new role view that you can get in the latest version uh, where you just pick a role and it'll just grab all the information that's related to the role. So all these tabs will automatically populate based on the, on the role that you pick in the model. And the really interesting one for me is actually this responsibility one. We seem to have gotten a lot of um, good feedback on it. So it's even the lower details. So not only just the processes that you play a role in, but what you actually do. So using the racy kind of tagging responsible, accountable, consulted, informed, that information is also uh, put up there. And then you can also use the filters to go, yeah, I'm a manager. I don't really want to be looking at my responsible work. So I'll just look at the stuff I get told about. So you can filter that as well. And then the other tab, uh, just like before, will just grab all the detailed content for you. So any work instructions that you might have linked uh, to the lower level detail, any supporting documents, any policies. So all that still works the same way. It's just a collector of information. And again, the key principle here is that you don't need to maintain this. Right? You set it up, you pick the role, and as you add content, it will just update itself, which is really the, the cool, cool aspect of it. The other thing, hopefully you noticed that the font's a little bigger. Um, Bruce isn't here, but Bruce used to have us the uh, used to uh, mention the, the font size a lot to us, especially when we, we're demoing on screen. You know, even, even now I'm running, I think, 1600 on a bigger resolution, it gets really small and it's really tough to see. So we actually upped the, uh, the font size, I think, from 9 to 11 or 12. What is it? Um, I think it was 8 or about oh, 11. Oh, was it 8 or 12? Yeah. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. It's even smaller, okay. So I'll, I'll actually show you the difference. Now, we've been using this for a while, so we've been, become accustomed to it, but the old, the old theme of the website is still there. If you really want the small one, I don't know if you would want the small one, but you can actually switch to it, and you'll see the difference um, when it re-renders itself again. So this was what it used to be. So it's a little bit, bit smaller, a bit tough to see. <coughs> I'm sure the guys in the back would probably go, what, what's Walter talking about? 
it's still a blurry anyway. But um, yeah, we've actually increased it, so it's a lot more readable. And this is actually more for the mobile uh, work that we're doing. Um, a lot of times, especially on the touch screen, you know, this, my computer is actually a touch screen. And when you have really small fonts, it's really hard to target fonts. Yeah? So we actually increased it just so it works better uh, with tablet devices as well. So let me go back and switch that back. Right. The other thing that we've added, um, and again, this is uh, a lot of feedback that we've gotten uh, over the years about our um, swim lane notation. So we've had swim lanes in there for, for Yonk, but there's been a lot of feedback about how that could be improved. And uh, so some of this stuff that I'm going to show you next is, is actually probably already configured for some of the clients that, that are in the room. So we've actually taken some of the, the learnings from, from what we've seen and applied it into a new standard um, swim lane uh, notation that we have. Here it is. So a few changes. We've been able to move the rollover to the, to the side. Um, that's something that we saw a lot in Visio and people who are used to kind of doing stuff in Visio. We still added the things that made us a little bit different to enhance the diagram, right? So things like these little annotations, this little uh, paper clip to say, hey, there's something there. That's something that we still added back on there because that's a big differentiator on our, on our mapping or our modeling of process. We tap tag when there's uh, important information behind it. Same thing with the warnings, cautions, and notes. That's probably still in there for some of you guys who, who have that on there. And the system. One of the changes that we've made in the recent years was that you could actually pick the system and then have it show up. And even have the icon of the system show up. So for the guys who actually have logos of, of your systems, it's, it's actually a lot more appealing because you can just you know, see the, the icon of your system show up. Um, so that's our new standard swim lane notation, and it's actually bigger too. So I don't have an example of an, an older one, but it's physically bigger because the font actually is the bigger size font on this as well. So on screen it reads a lot easier, and when you print it out, it's a lot, a lot easier to read. Whereas previously the eight, eight size font, when we printed it out, sometimes got got squeezed down and it became really hard hard to read. That still supports all the the stuff that's been out since Barracuda, the 7.3 release. So the for example the process step list. All that is still there. That's all supported. So all it is is just another skin, I suppose, on the process um, um, mapping side of things. It, it still supports everything else that we've already had in there. Now, with every kind of release, one of the things that we always look at is how we improve performance. It's always about how, how quickly you can load things, how, how do you make it more efficient. And I'm not going to quote you numbers, but I'll show you a, an example. Uh, some of these grid views, so some of these tabled views that we used to have would take a few seconds to load. Uh, Dave, uh, Derek and his team have done some magic. I don't know I don't know how he's done it, but he's been able to really increase the responsiveness of it. So now it actually loads really quick. Um, I'm sure some of you guys have seen demos where, you know, you've seen me talk through, get to that certain point when then I talk about the grid view and then I have to talk through the empty space for a few seconds. Right? <coughs> we, don't, we don't have as much of that now. So you go to any of these um, grid views, the responsiveness is, is, is there. Um, and again, font size increases as well. So there's also some minor incre uh, improvements in even just the model and modelpedia uh, uh, performance as well. But that obviously didn't, uh, uh, wasn't, wasn't a thousand percent uh, bigger, so we haven't mentioned it as much, but there's some incre incremental improvements. Are you using more Some of the libraries that we work with are almost twice as quick when we publish them. And we end up as part of that presentation more as well on the service uh, and they're just snappy to use. A lot of the performance improvements around those grids were grouping and putting some of the load off of the server and making it more efficient. And that's, so it's a lot quicker. So a lot. The other big part of the latest release was uh, more for projects. So a lot of, uh, some of you guys are uh, in big project um, teams where you're not just capturing process, you're actually producing documentation like business requirements documents. And over the years, we've probably configured more than a handful. You know, every, everybody seems to have a flavor for their BRDs, and we've been able to configure um, certain ones for different people. But we, we noticed some patterns in what we saw out there. Because the BRD is a BRD. You have process, you have requirements, you have the details of requirements. There's a bit of a pattern. And we finally put a new standard one in there based on what we saw out in the market. So it wasn't a holocentric 
unique design of what a BRD was. It was actually bring in and have a look at what uh, people were actually producing. And we produced a, um, a brand new BRD uh, document. Now, it's not just a document because what we actually added into our model, and this is something that I suppose been, been, a, been a, uh, a missing point to our modeling was that we didn't have a business requirement item per se. We had these other objects that kind of played that role. So we've actually added a new business requirement item and a new high-level business requirement item out of the box. So if you capture the high-level business requirements, business requirements, and just the high-level process, you can already generate a high-level BRD. So for programs who aren't going to map process down, right down to the detail yet, they can even get started quickly. You can get them to use holocentric just to capture their requirements, just to capture the processes at a high level and get them out output that they can give to people. And then at the lower level, you can capture the detail. So down at the process step level, down the functional requirements and non-functional requirements, when you capture that information on top, then you can generate the detailed BRD. So it's just an evolution of the, the high level. And again, that's what we saw in the market. A lot of people, when they start a program, they're not going to dive straight into detailed requirements. Like they'll start at the high level requirements uh, level and then develop that over time. So again, this is um, something that we developed so it could be out of the box. You can actually generate it. So what we will see is that clients will probably just change the branding, like a lot of the templates that we have. You always slap on your own branding, your own font, that sort of stuff. But the core of it would be pretty much uh, what we've got out of the box. Now, I was going to jump to Modla and show you, but let me just check if I've got that open. Yes, I do. Oh, no connection. So I'll just connect quickly and open it up. So in in the um, model when you open it up, it's not a server-based one. So you would have seen some of you guys who are on Barracuda, we've moved a lot of the reporting onto the website, so you instigate it from the website. The BRD is actually still instigated from Modler. So up the top, the old uh, Word Report Wizard will now have just two more uh, reports in there. And if I'll just generate it out. What we also changed was that this report now actually lives in Modeler. What I mean by that was historically when we generated documents, there was probably some preamble at the front of a document like version control, who's, uh, who's seen it, all sorts of other information. We usually said, hey, you need to manage that outside of Modeler. What we've now done in Modeler is actually have that as part of the BRD document item. That actually is in Modeler. So you can actually up update and maintain that information in Modeler. It actually will re record it. So if you added the version today, and then the next version you can actually add to that, to that detail. So, like I said, all that preamble is uh, now in the actual model. And then like every other document, all that rich content that you have in the model just comes out in some kind of logical sequence. And again, this, we base this off uh, what we saw our clients do. So, I'll just scroll down. Press the diagram comes out in the, in the format and then you have under, after, afterwards the kind of process step list design and the requirement that's linked to them. So you have the traceability between process and requirement. And then right down the bottom is all the kind of appendix, appendix type information where you have a listing of all the functional requirements and the traceability between the high level of the business to functional requirement. All that's now in the, in the software. Okay. Um, so that's the BRD. Let me jump into... Walter, are there hyperlinks between the parts of the document? Yeah, that's a really cool aspect of it as well. So not only is it um, just a document with all the detail, it's actually usable. You can actually jump between them. Actually, Simon, most of you guys uh, know Simon Dale Guru when, he, when it comes to this. So Simon actually put a lot of effort into making it quite usable. Um, so the, the design reflects that or the outcome reflects that. Okay, um, back to model P. But the, the last one I want to talk about is usage and change history. So even since Modelpedia version 1, we actually were logging statistics. So we knew who was logging in, when they were looking at it. So we already had that information and, and actually helped a few clients when we were rolling out content. So there's a few in the room where we actually used it uh, as more of a change program. So we would publish content out to the business and then monitor it and see who was actually looking at it. So we can actually see the business units that weren't really engaging with the content that we put out. 
Um, but that was quite hard. So historically, uh, in the old version, you, we actually needed to query the SQL database. So our support team needed to log into the server, do a SQL query, and get this Excel dump, and then we would have to transform it into something that was meaningful. So there was a bit of a process uh, to actually making it usable. Um, what we've done in the latest version is actually put it and, and made it available on Modelpedia. So you can actually see some of that information via Modelpedia. So what, what I'm going to show you first is, is the first release of this. Um, and we know, you know some of the feedback, and, and to Derek's point, some of the feedback on how you would use it is probably going to shape how we would actually end up um, delivering it. Um, so what I'm, what I'm going to show you now is available via the um, menu bar. So when you're uh, in version 2.5, you go to menu. There are two new, let me just move that down. There are two new uh, buttons. One about changes and one about history. So slightly different angles. Changes is about what's new and what I need to look at, where usage is my, my usage or other people's usage, depending on my authority. Obviously, if I'm a manager, then I can see probably a broader range of use, usage. You don't want people to kind of stalk other people and look at other people's usage. So there's, there's authority that you can, you can set mm -hmm. there. So let's look at usage. OK, so there's three um, slices of this information. First one is kind of like a web browser. It just remembers what I've looked at. In, in, in history. So today you can see I was um, stepping through the model and it knows exactly what I was look, looking at. So that's just a basic what have, what have I looked at. Now obviously you can do that in the browser, but the difference in this is that you can filter that information. What happens is when there are things that you've looked at that's changed, you get a highlighted. So on the second page, there was actually something that I had previously looked at at lunch that has since been modified. And that's actually highlighted to me. So I can look back in time and go, OK, what have I looked at that's changed since? So that's by time. The other way to look at it is by popularity. Now we've been doing some analysis to go, well, hang on. Maybe the stuff that's more popular is what you're more interested in. So you can see I've hit this, to me personally, as my login, as Walter, I've touched this diagram 28 times. It's kind of scary that I've looked at this thing 28 times. Um, but it records with that. And if I was a manager, or if I was a custodian or an administrator of the entire content set, actually what I would look like is something like this, where it's most popular. Across my entire model, across this context, what's actually people looking at? What, what are the processes that are getting a lot of airplay? Um, so I can actually see that. So that's, again, from usage. The other angle, then, is about changes. Again, a lot of feedback that we got was, uh, and even in our demos, you'll hear that people want to be drawn to stuff that's changed. Uh, when you go to a, to a website, you don't want to manually find and look for the stuff that's changed. You want to kind of be told and prompted what's changed. And because of the publishing, and because of all these statistics that we're putting, we know exactly what's changed. We even know the stuff that you've looked at that's changed. So again, we can, we can start, to step, start to push that information out. So by recording this information, then we can actually do something about it in some later releases to actually target more information to people. So changes. You do need to do a context. Now, the reason for this screen is when you do changes, can you imagine some of the models that you guys have is quite large. So that set of information is going to be quite overwhelming. So you can actually narrow this down. So if you're actually in a diagram or in a process area or in a specific area, you can actually just narrow the stats down to that context. Now, this model isn't too big, so I'll just do the uh, entire model. My quick screen. Still might be too big. Oh, my Wi-Fi is capped down. Try that again. Yes, Wi-Fi. There we go. Is that Right, so since the last publication that was tagged as productive, worthy, the final production worthy release versus this production worthy. So it was the, uh, oh no, the other way around. So since the 1st of uh, April till now, these are all the things that have changed in the model. Every little thing that's been changed. And now because I've got a bit of an administrator access, I can do some stalking actually. So I can, I can have a look. So it knows when I looked at it. So I looked at it today. But because I've got administrator access, I can actually see who's, who looked at it as well. Now, the more powerful thing in the discussions that we've had is who hasn't looked at it. 
is the, the one that we really want to know about when we publish it out. Right? So obviously that, that inverse information is available. It's just that in the UI we've just put who has. We've just put a positive spin on it for now. So actually let me let me have a look at this. Let me see who you have. Ah, three of my team members, bar one. Okay. Hmm, nice. So so that information, like that, all that login, we're trying to just do something about it and put it in, in, in the uh, Modelpedia. The other one is about my unseen, and this is probably the more the most important one. You know, time short, I just want to go and say, hey, what's new that I haven't seen? You know what's new, you know what I haven't looked at, just tell me what it is. Stop, stop trying to make me find it. So when you click on my unseen changes, <coughs> this is everything that I haven't looked at that's changed. But if I look at it, it will drop off the list. <coughs> So in a way, it's kind of like my to-do list, my, my how I catch up. And, and the scenario that came about was when you have employees that disappear for a while on annual leave for a couple of weeks and they come back, it's a quick way to update them on what's changed. So you don't need to you know, have a sit down and, and get them to read everything. You can actually just send them to Modelpedia because Modelpedia knows what they've last looked at. Okay. Um, one last thing. Let me just switch back. Uh, to Modelpedia, I'll just give something earlier. Oh, so I switch back to Modeler. One of the um, things that we did in recent years was actually work on um, importing information. So some of you guys have seen this and, and used it. So that's still here. So right now I've got a listing of process steps in a process diagram. And at the moment you can import this. So I'll just copy it from Excel and I'll just paste it into my model. So I've added the item by Excel, right? Copy and paste into into Modeler. Now it doesn't draw the diagram for me yet, but what I want to show you is actually a new feature in the Swimline notation. So if I just quickly draw this diagram, uh, I think it's job uh, I'll add a probably another one, line manager, and then just drag these activities into the diagram. So hopefully you guys notice even in Modeler the font size is bigger. That's just a 100% zoom at the moment, so I don't need to do anything special. So the new notation has dedicated start and end points, and then I'll just go and connect them up. Now, one of the things as a person that draws a lot of process maps is <coughs> we see a lot of people um, manually adjusting diagrams. It's funny, I, I think I sat down once with a process analyst and watched them collect information. They spent about five minutes collecting it, and then spend the next half an hour adjusting the diagram, trying to make it look nice, right? Um, so we've updated the algorithm for the layout tool, just so at least you'll get a decent result for some of the simple diagrams. Because obviously for the really complex ones, it's really hard to work out how to how to do the mapping, right? So in the uh, toolbox for the new swim lane notation, there's an auto layout tool, and if you hit that, it will just do uh, a very um, basic spacing and at least give you something that you can actually use pretty quickly. And again, we're trying to cut down that time from people getting content into the model, making it look nice. And um, you know, I think in later releases, Derek's probably going to put in some more uh, nicer layout functionality to even improve that even further. And I think the feedback, probably sending uh, um, examples of diagrams that you have on, on site is probably a good way to get that ball rolling. And I think this cab might even talk about that in a future release. Okay. Um, just before I hand over, I actually wanted then to just take a break in for, for questions. Uh, showed you a few of the, the new features. Does anybody in the room have any questions before I go to the guys on the uh, webinar? Well, I've got another. Uh, in terms of the change that we're looking at, where you can see what's been modified, what's the level of granularity you can see? I can see there that the process diagram is modified, but how do I know mm. whether that was an, a step added or a step changed on it? Yeah, yeah. It actually tells you. It actually does tell you. So I, the example that I that I showed you didn't didn't really um, tell you too much. But if I go into, oh, well, I don't. I probably don't have an example. Let me, let me um, the first screen you saw had context. If you select a VPAD context, for example, yes. um, then you can. It will take everything underneath that business process area diagram, including yep. processes, um, process steps. And it will tell you whether it's been added or removed from that context as well. If it's been okay. removed and yeah. deleted from the entire model, it will tell you it's been deleted, right. um, so you know it's gone. 
Um, so you have to worry about sort of, oh, you know, am I getting the right relationships or yeah. all that? And I guess, so, I guess which model are added it, which model are deleted it? So does it keep track of that? Um, the not on that screen. Um, the tool does. Yeah, it's got the yeah. So the the, the context is the important <coughs> for that. So in terms of statistics, it's actually logging every action. Yes. Uh, yes. The point here is in the UI, we just just showed a couple of uses of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's we fine. realize that you probably have more time. This is information in what yeah. changed, and I'm just wondering now. Yeah. Um, improvements made in how you can track what got changed in terms of quality audits and things like that. The other thing that we added probably was it 18 months ago was change markup. So some of you guys have probably even haven't seen it, and unfortunately I don't have it in this example. Is when it's just text change, when you have a paragraph and then you go <coughs> edit it, we've actually got the highlights when you publish in Modelpedia. We actually do the um, text markup like in Word. We'll have a change bar down the side and give you the, the text markup on screen. Um, so if you guys want to see that, <coughs> there's another demo another time to show you that. But that's, again, part of the standard uh, tool set that we have now. So that came out in 7.3, I think. Joe, was it? The change marker. And in the uh, process step diagrams, can you go into a sub-process and out of a sub-process? Is it easy to add a sub-process as a, uh, as a uh, process step or activity? Yeah, so the, the meta model hasn't changed. So even though the in the in the diagram it looks like a new you know, a mapping style, the meta model is still the same. So in terms of able to link to other diagrams or steps, that's still there. So if registered job application is in that step, is that sub process, then it's one can drop that in and then go into it and out of it again from each Yeah, you would link to it. So out of here normally if we wanted a sub process and we would actually come into the relationships and add a uh, another process. Um, yeah. Yeah. So can you still see the processes that are actually using the old icons or are they just replaced by these? So is this new in addition or yep. is it replacing? Yeah, it's in addition. So this is just a skin. This is just a skin based <coughs> on what we've been getting. Yeah. That is, that's one of the big uh, selling points of our century, right? The ability to kind of flip and change that information. The core of it's the same, it's just how you present it. So do we change that when we publish it, or can the user see it differently in Modelpedia at the point of runtime, mm. like between them? Yeah, so you've still got to pick one. So a lot of times we get asked, okay, what if you know that person wants that notation, that other person wants the other notation, and generally we say, well, you should have a consistent notation for an organisation. Don't give them five choices. So we're picking at build time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, but it's, yeah, same functionality, so you can flip it still. So like I said, this is the new standard. So if you get 7.5 um, tomorrow, um, that will be the default notation if you want to start a new diagram. That's our new default. Now, it doesn't mean that all the ones that you've been using aren't supported. If you load up your libraries, that's what will load up. So you actually opt, have to opt in into this for the existing clients. It's not, well, we'll just change the world on you tomorrow when you've got the new version. Just with decision walker, what are the level of complexity of decision jets and yes, no decision? So for this specific notation, we decided to not adapt the full plethora of XORs and AND gates and uh, OR gates, uh, because this is this was more tailored at the end user, about just the business consumer, not the people who are modeling kind of workflow-y type diagrams. Now, if you want to go down that path, we have that BPMN diagram that we have that supports that, and we, we generally don't suggest <coughs> the consumption, but it's still there. Just to add to, to Jan's question, um, if, if users don't like the diagram or the rendering of the diagram, they can always switch to that process set list for the next user yep. to bring that up. Yep. So um, that's automatically generated. So if you just model the diagram, yep. Modelpedia will turn that into that process set list automatically. So you don't have to do any work. And that's regardless of the notation you've applied. Yep. I think that this is a lot of traction of late. Um, We've had more people say, yeah, we don't even care about the diagram anymore after we get the step list. Because it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's just easier to consume. Right? A lot of people look at it and go, well, that's not scary. Whereas sometimes the diagrams that we see, they get really messy and people just go, well, I can't understand what's going on. Whereas with a list, it's, uh, it's a list. You can just read through it straightforward. It's not scary.
So just a question about um, your user stats. So you show that how you can do changes to um, existing models and you can track where you sort of need to have. Is there a way to sort of that on the whole server? So for the two kind of admins mm -hmm. at least to see how many users have logged in in a month or something. Yep. Yes there is. Is there? Okay. Yeah, but um just in the, in the back and scratch. Be yeah. um, but it, it it lets you basically download it. Yeah. It's actually quite exciting. Some of the some of the clients who are uh, uh, looking at their stats, you can just see, especially if you're content, one of the really fine uh, aspects of building content is when people are consuming it. And uh, there are a few examples of it even in this room where you can just see it kind of grow over time, and it just makes you you know feel that you know um, that what all the effort you've put into creating all this content is actually real because people are actually looking at it. Okay. Any other questions in the room? Have you got a demo or anything like that on your website for this? A demo? Yeah. So you know oh. that you have the continuous improvement. Ah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Have you got anything like that that demonstrates this current functionality on the website? Uh, not specifically. We have got a new video coming out next week. <coughs> that's, cool. that's more on the process improvement side of things. It does, does touch on some of the change usage and the revision market functionality very briefly. But it's only a three minute video. So it's it's quite great. Can you send me a link to it then, please? Yep. Can you do that? Yep. One of the things that we've done in the marketing team is actually have uh, regular webinars. So one of the ways that we've, we, or one of the, the things that we've seen is sometimes you guys will run into uh, new people who don't really know what Holocentric is about and you don't want to spend two hours or three hours explaining it to them. So we've, we've created a webinar every week that we run. Yep, every where, Wednesday, three o'clock. There you go. Um, <laughs> Where you can just send them along. Just go go to the whole central website, register for the webinar, and keep we'll watching all the way home. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll run a webinar, and it's and it's live. Thanks. Sorry. Yep. Yeah. So it's not it's not a pre-recording. It's actually we actually sit in and do it because we actually get people to show up. So people who aren't clients and and where even existing clients who uh, met some new people, we just need to be educated. It's just a good way to to show them the capability because I'm sure you guys have all realised, you know, when you're trying to explain what we do. And the software, it's kind of undersells it unless you can see it. And when people see it, they get it. Um, okay, more questions? Let me just see if there was any on the chat. Where is it? It's over here. I don't think so because normally it would pop up. Okay, looks like uh, everybody's cool on the chat. <laughs> Alright, um, I'm going to hand over to uh, Ed to actually tell you about some of the, uh, the training that we've updated as well. Hey, my name is uh, Ed O'Brien. I'll speak up. Give me a second, Ed. The demo's done. Good. I'm just going to quickly talk to you about the, the training courses put on offer. Um, before I do that, though, I was going to talk about the CMS and what that actually means. This is a management system. It should be fairly obvious because we've been using the acronym all day. In case it's not, I thought I would describe what that is. So from our point of view and what we do, it is the white space. It's the system between your people, your process and your technology. That provides a context layer so that everyone can, sorry, I like wandering. So everyone can uh, understand it from your managers all the way through the process performance. What that allows you to do, I can uh, drive this effectively, is to, at one level, have uh, operational effectiveness. Capture set standard operating procedures. Publish those out to all your people. Continuous feedback, improve those over time. Once you've done that, you can improve your processes through, I think, what you're asking, process analysis. So you can capture the metrics. You can lean your processes if you want. At the same time, using your standard operating procedures, you can drive business transformation. So major system projects to little projects. You can do what Walt has just described, generate out business requirements documents. Okay. Because it's a very large uh, platform, we haven't showed you a lot of it really today. You can capture all your strategy items. Make sure that you're aligned, your business is aligned to what you want to do as a business. The other side of the ledger, we've got the governance piece as well. So your uh, compliance burden. 
we can capture that. Make sure that your people know what they're meant to be doing. And of course, all of that is predicated on the fact that you're capturing good content. Okay? And how we can help you today and ongoing, things like the webinars, but we've got courses available. So standard operating procedures, content author one and two, essentially get your people up and running. Okay? Let them capture rich content all the way from processes through to videos, publishing that out, making sure they do it in a consistent manner. <coughs> Business transformation, we are in the process in tandem with this uh, launch of generating a business requirements modeling course so that your people can probably DA, I would think, more uh, process savvy and come in in one day. Okay. And lastly, there's a process improvement course, teaching uh, people who need to know and want to know about process improvement. So that's capturing uh, statistics and leaning in the processes. And you don't have to start here and then there. You can do this separately, for example, if you want. Move on to the, the standard operating procedure course. And sitting over the top is something called the content manager course. It's designed for the system administrator really teaching them how to be self-sufficient so they can be the holocentric consultant on your, on your side. There are some upcoming courses. All this information is available on the website. Um, Walter, have you got the website there? I'll kind of quickly show. And we might actually also show you the, how to register for the, the, uh, the webinar as well. Good. So the under support is the training courses and all the dates. You can register at those dates, or you can just call contact us. And the webinar, where is that? What? A webinar, live demo. Oh, right there. Live demo. Hey, hey, it should be easy to find. Okay. Cool. Taking up enough of your time. Hand it over to Dwight here. Thank you. Okay. I think I'm, am I between you guys and something to eat, I think, so I won't take too long. Yep. Okay, so I'm going to talk about, hopefully this is loud enough for the people on the webinar, um, something I'm really excited about, and hopefully you guys will be too, the Customer Advisory Board. Now, many of you have talked to us, they've pleaded with us, saying, can we get a seat at the table? Can we guide, can we tell you what we need, right? And we've finally listened and we're about to set up a customer advisory board. Not to say we weren't listening before. <laughs> Maybe we're doing something more about it this time. Okay. So, firstly, what's in the view? Why would you want to be, or why might you want to be in a customer advisory board? Tell us what you want. Tell us what you want in terms of priorities, planning, uh, the product roadmap in general. Right? May, tell us so that we can align what we do to support your needs. Right? You guys know what your organisation is. You guys know your industry much better than we do. So we want to hear that. You will get insight and access to early previews of the product. So both in design, concept stage, design, throughout the roadmap, throughout the life cycle of our releases, we want to share that with you. Early access to upgrades, be on the leading edge, not the bleeding edge. But by having insight into what's down, coming down the pipe, you'll probably want to get access to that technology sooner. And these are the ones that I'm, I'm most excited about, building a more collaborative community. So coming from the practitioner side, it's not all about the vendor. We're the vendor after all. It's about the community. So building the relationships amongst yourselves that we don't want to get in the way of. You guys actually build relationships with each other, share your learning, share your experience of what works and, and what hasn't. Right? Um, and then share that with us and then we can help facilitate that going forward. Be a sounding board. So you guys can have your own confidential discussions. Uh, you can build those relationships and use that to your advantage to, to say, hey, let's make this work or we we're thinking about doing it this way. Uh, what did you guys do? Right? So you can start to use that and of course personal networking. So those are the things that I'm hopeful that you guys will think are interesting and might be reasons to join up. Mm. What's in it for us? 
looking at the whole centric? Well, we want to gain your insight. Warts and all, we want to hear the feedback. Right? Um, we do want to hear the positive stories, what's working as well. But we want to hear unfiltered what things aren't working so that we can address them. That might be, we also want to hear about your industry and, and your organisation and the challenges you face. Right? So being a, a general product that caters across a number of industries, we don't know what's going on. You might say, hey, there's this major regulatory change happening in the next six months. Um, get on it, Holocentric, and, and we can do something about it. So we want to hear that um, and make, of course, that will help us be more successful. And of course, it will go on. So how does it work? Um, at this stage, we're looking for a small group, six to ten people. Um, people who are really passionate about it, people about Holocentric and, and um, want to be part of that driving of the future direction of the product. Um, we're accepting nominations right now. Okay, so, so if you're interested, please let us know. Um, we're going to do some facilitation. We'll take on some logistical stuff. There'll be an overhead that we'll manage. And we'll organise those interactive workshops. But we want the, the representatives, those people on the board, to help to drive what we look at. So there might be a business issue you want us to probe into, and we might organise a meeting to talk about that particular issue. Regular communications, and we'll also keep you updated on things that are happening in the holocentric world. So when we're moving towards a new release, when we're looking to do some user experience design, when we're looking to do beta testing, we'll be looking for that advisory board to work with us and, and hopefully provide some insight and assistance with those, those activities. I can all hear you say, where do I sign up? <coughs> yes? <coughs> okay, great. So, um, Nominations for you on Friday the 15th, so please um, let us know. Uh, we'll then rapidly turn around and select <coughs> um, We want to get a broad range of industries and, and perspectives. Um, we'll try not to um, have any competitive interests on there so that you can have more free and frank discussions with people, so we're mindful of that. Um, and we're going to have the first meeting or first workshop before the 30th of June. That's kind of my goal. Uh, that Bruce is going to be holding me accountable for. So we will be doing that. Uh, you can contact me directly, so send me an email, or you can speak to anyone in the whole Centric team or your account manager and just express interest. So, is that short enough? Okay, Derek, do you want to wrap up and then we'll celebrate? Okay. Well, thanks again for coming. Thanks for staying through the whole thing. Um, we hope that you'll see a lot of benefits in the new features we've got. If you've got any questions, we're here to talk to afterwards, and we hope you guys sign up for the for the um, advisory board. Thanks for coming. Enjoy. Thank you.